Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Man in America. I'm your host, Seth Holhouse. So today's episode I am very excited for, but it's also a solemn episode because everywhere we look, the America we once knew is barely recognizable. Empty shelves, a collapsing dollar, tent cities, soaring drug overdoses, riots, race wars, drag queen story hour, thought control, censorship, and a hatred and social unrest that's reaching boiling point. It's as if we woke up in a dystopian novel with attacks coming from all angles. And what if that's precisely the point? What if these aren't just isolated events? What if everything that we're seeing in our country right now is part of a diabolical 100-year plan by the Chinese Communist Party to crush America and gain dominion over the entire world? Today, I'll be speaking with General Robert Spaulding, a retired brigadier general from the U.S. Air Force and a national security expert who has studied the CCP for decades and who is warning us of the imminent threat it poses. Folks, today's show is brought to you by Rise TV. It's an amazing streaming platform for patriots, by patriots. The second half of today's show, we're going to do a Q&A with General Spaulding. So if you want to join that, in addition to getting access to a ton of other amazing content, there's a free trial in the description below. So just click on the link below and join us on Rise TV for the Q&A. And folks, as you'll see in today's show, the global financial system is teetering on the edge of catastrophe, especially the U.S. dollar, which is very close to losing its status as the world reserve currency and petrodollar. For those of you who have your savings in an IRA or the stock market, you may want to consider moving some of your money into assets that have stood the test of time, gold and silver. And to do that, I highly recommend Noble Gold. They've got an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and hundreds of five-star ratings. So with Noble Gold, you can either buy gold and silver directly, have it shipped to you, or you can do an IRA transfer, which is what they specialize in. That allows you to transfer your IRA into physical gold and silver with zero taxes or penalties. So if you want to learn more about this, open up a new tab right now and go to goldwithseth.com. Or you can call 877-646-5347 to speak to someone right now. The folks at Noble Gold will hold your hand throughout the entire process, answer all your questions. So give them a call today, 877-646-5347. All right, folks, so today's show is a very important topic, and I think it's a topic that every major media should be covering, but they're not. This should be the topic of everything in the White House, but it's not. And the my guest today, General Spaulding, I first saw on a series of interviews with the Epoch Times with Yanya Kalik over at American Thought Leaders, and I then went out and bought his book, which he's got a couple of books out. This is his most recent one called War Without Rules, and his previous one is called Stealth War. Both of these books I highly, highly recommend because they give a very clear picture of what the Chinese Communist Party is doing, how it's been waging war against the United States for a very long time. It's just not the kind of war that we recognize intentionally, and a little bit of insight into what their end game is. So without further ado, let's go and bring on my guest today, Robert, General Robert Spaulding. So, General Spaulding, thank you so very, very much for joining me today. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, do you want to give us just a quick introduction of yourself and, and your background? Sure. You know, I grew up in California. I thought I was going to uh, farm on the family farm. I got a degree in ag business. And then uh, in my senior year in college, I saw this movie, Top Gun. I thought, wow, that would be interesting. And so I ended up joining the Air Force, spent a career in the Air Force, uh, flying the B-2, a stealth bomber, but also spent quite a bit of time in China, uh, including being the senior defense official in Beijing and then the senior director for strategy at the National Security Council, where I worked on our national security strategy and where a lot of the um, you know thoughts that go into my books really came from. So it's been a, it's been a totally different career than I aspired to. Uh, when I was growing up, but um, it was uh, nevertheless been very, um, it's been a blessing. And but your, the books, the, both your books I've read, and you've, you've written more, have really focused on China's really goal to overtake America and to wage a constant war in America. When in your career did you start to see that this was just what their plans were? 
Well, I lived there as an uh, what's called an Olmsted scholar from 2002 to 2004. So, Olmsted scholars um, go uh, overseas. So, I was a, a young, just pinned on major uh, in the Air Force and uh, was selected for the program. I went to learn Chinese at the Defense Language Institute. So, I spent a year studying in Monterey, California, and then I went to live in Shanghai with my family. And, and studied at a university uh, there for two years and traveled the country and got to know the people, the culture, the history, the geography of China. And it was a fantastic, wonderful experience. And, um, and you know, I told my wife when I left in 2004, I wanted to go back and, uh, and work in China because it was, such a, um, so, it was such a fantastic, really, experience. And the Chinese people were, you know, so friendly. And then um, later on, as I rose in rank and had the opportunity to work for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs on uh, U.S.-China policy, is really when I began began to become aware of you know how the Chinese Communist Party actually operated. I didn't really you don't see it there living in the ground um, with the people, um, particularly because uh, you know if you're not Chinese, you're not going to really understand what's going on, and they do a good job of hiding it from outsiders. But understanding how, what the Communist Party is and how it works and operates is something that, you know, since I've come to understand. And, and so it's really almost 2014, you know, by the time that I really had the opportunity to, to start to really get into what this was. And, it's, uh, you know, it's been a, a, an incredible um, journey because it's such a different world when you start to understand kind of what they're doing and how they do it. So your book is very focused on a, a book that was released by two high-level generals, if I understand correctly, um, in Chinese generals that was in the late, I think it was 99, right, called Unrestricted Warfare. And to me, that was, so I bought the original version of it that was just the direct translation, but also your second book, um, really does a good job of, of translating it and interpreting it. So can you just give a summary of what UW, Unrestricted Warfare, is and just how, though it feels like right now we're not in a war, but through the, in the, from the perspective of the Chinese, that they may have been waging a war against the United States for a very, very long time. And they've just identified that war is no longer just missiles and guns and bullets, but it's financial, it's social media, it's intellectual property. So can you give, give a little explanation of what unrestricted warfare is? Yeah, so I, um, you know, as a B-2 pilot and as an Air Force officer, I studied war for, you know, most of my adult life. And uh, you, I, you know, have, you know, long-term professional military education, spent a year at the Air War College uh, where we just do nothing but study, you know, war and you know the politics surrounding war, and I think the um, the the thing that really s- struck me was when I in 2014 when I was working for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I got this briefing. This briefing sent to me by um, somebody that I'd met in in Wall Street uh, when I was a uh, senior military fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and this briefing set out, you know, the attack that was coming from China on several U.S. companies. And they were various sizes from various industries. And when I um, when I looked at this briefing, it reminded me of my time, you know, planning the, the Kosovo War. And so the easiest way to, to understand this is, you know, in the Kosovo War, really when the war uh, was brought to its conclusion, the way it was brought to its conclusion was using B-2s, so airplanes that I flew, dropping 2,000-pound bombs on the assets of the leaders in Serbia supporting Milosevic, who was the leader of Serbia at the time. It was warehouses. It was factories. It was real estate. It was the things that um, the people, the elites in Serbia owned. And so we would take them out and night after night. And after two weeks, they had had enough, and Milosevic ended up having to go face, um, you know, war crimes tribunal in The Hague. What I saw in this briefing was a similar kind of war, and it was, uh, it was focused on the assets, you know, American assets. So 
when you start to dig into this at a very basic level, it's using many of the concepts of war. It's just turned on its head and used in a way because, you know, as Clausewitz, who's a, a very famous uh, war theot- theoretician, he was a Prussian general, said, you know, famously, war is politics by other means. In other words, you use military force to achieve a political outcome. What the Chinese Communist Party recognized with globalization and the Internet, this bringing together of um, the world was going to open up the opportunity to make warfare political as a means for getting what you want. So rather than using the tools that I had been trained with, bombs and airplanes, you could use finance, trade, economics, politics, uh, and technology, like you said, social media, to begin to influence those you know, nations and, in particular, those elites of those nations that could do the types of things that you needed them to do. And so in that book, Unrestricted Warfare, that you talk about, they lay out how you might go about influencing the elites of another country to enable them to achieve your interests. And one thing that you spoke about in your earlier book was the, the multiple times when you wanted to do, ha- you, you started, you saw the writing on the wall and you wanted to have different organizations or governmental bodies do more research into the threat of China and how you just were met with closed door after closed door to closed door. Everything from things within the government to corporations to um, other various organizations that sh- that were should have been the ones that were researching what was happening. So, which really pointed out that the level of how compromised a lot of people in our country are, companies, and it may not be compromised through, say, blackmail, but mail, but a lot of it was actually just through financial. They've got Chinese investors, and therefore they're not going to step on their toes. And the Chinese have known that. So, in your experience, how much of our government and you know our corporations, media, et cetera, are actually directly or indirectly being controlled by the Chinese Communist Party? It's almost totally, um, to be honest with you. And, and the reason is um, not because they're, they're traitorous or they're, you know, they want to seek the downfall of the United States in terms of you know, our corporate leaders or our financial leaders, but their financial interests, and by law, they're as, uh, as fiduciaries of the companies, they're responsible for seeking the best outcome for shareholders. And so what the Chinese have done is it very astutely created this interweaving of their interests with our interests. And so when um, if they were to say, hey, we should impose tariffs or we should do something that protects against this influence by the Chinese Communist Party, essentially what they would be advocating for would be restricting some of the earnings potentials that they have, for example, in China. And so in doing so, they would be acting against the best interests of the company. And so, in, in a way, what these two colonels, uh, PLA colonels, recognized was that we, the West, was opening up our system in a way that would allow them to influence us using our own rules. And so, by essentially saying they're going to agree with the ideas of free trade or you know, an open financial system or transparency – but then not doing so, they, are, they enable this slow infiltration of our corporations, our financial institutions, also our academic institutions, in a way that over time begins to affect our political institutions. Because, you know, again, politics are influenced by corporations because corporations you know, spend money on lobbyists to you know, lobby Washington, D.C. Same with Wall Street. Um, our academic institutions, a lot of the professors that come out of those academic institutions ends up going and being senior officials in governments. And so they are also um, influenced because of all of these um, partnerships with Chinese universities and and you know all of these students that are um, invited to come over. And so there it is a it is a well um, you know documented, well rehearsed, and actually re- well executed, way to go about undermining the the institutions of a democratic uh, America or other democracies without having to go and use the weapons of war to destroy them. Which has given them significant control over our country. But, you know, one question with this is, what is China's end goal? 
what, what I know that they, there's been different speeches and different you know books and information published have come from some of the leaders and even going back to you know Mao and in his uh, you know just urge to get back at the West for the embarrassment that that they suffered whether it's from the Opium Wars or um, other events that happened but you know is does China is their end goal global control I mean is their end goal uh, scrubbing the earth from capitalism and replacing it with their communist system. Well, when you think of China you, and, and, and what is the goal of China and why you know, conduct this activity, you actually have to go to the source. So the source is the Chinese Communist Party. It's about 94 million, 95 billion or so members strong of 1.4 billion Chinese. They control the country. There's actually two constitutions in China. There's the People's Republic of China Constitution and there's the Chinese Communist Party Constitution. The Chinese Communist Party is the sovereign of the country. In fact, the constitution of the party says the party will remain in charge of China. So their goal is basically to stay in charge. The problem is, is they see democracies as a key you know, obstacle to their continued rule. They believe that if the um, if the principles of liberty that are you know essentially underpin our society become, you know, embedded in uh, Chinese, um, you know, popular belief or in their in their uh, society, then they will be overthrown. And so their their need, and they, this is one one of the things they talk about in the document that they have called Document Number Nine, that was uh, leaked in 2013. It talks about the need to suppress the principles of liberty so that they don't um, catch, you know, um, catch, you know, root in China, in in China society. So they want to the Chinese Communist Party wants to continue to stay in charge. Now, they also believe the party does that China should be the dominant country in the world. They believe that China uh, was the dominant country in the world for 5000 years. It had. Um, a few hundred years of bad luck, particularly uh, with the rise of the West and the Enlightenment period and, you know, the peace of Westphalia. But now, you know, China is back again and they're going to use the technology, the talent, the capital of the West to slowly, you know, grow their power and then over time begin to dominate the international institutions and promote a theory of social and political organization that more fits with um, the interests of the Chinese Communist Party. In other words, if the rest of the world is authoritarian, then it's safe for Chinese authoritarianism. They don't have to worry about their people, you know, getting this idea of liberty because it won't exist anywhere in the world. So it's almost like, say, you know, during Mao's time when there wasn't mass media like we have today, there wasn't social media, the internet. If there is an idea of freedom in America, it was very difficult for that idea to infect the minds of the people in China. The people in China were very easy to control. But now even you know, a lot of Chinese users are using VPNs to bypass the Great Firewall. They're traveling overseas. It's become more and more difficult for them to prevent that, that cancerous idea of freedom and democracy from spreading into their own people and giving them a window into what life is really like under the CCP versus someone in America, et cetera. So it's almost like if they want to maintain their system, they have to expand their control and they can't really have any examples of freedom and democracy around the world because those will remain a threat to them. Yeah, I guess the one, um, I, the one, um, I guess, you know, good thing to come out of technology was the recognition by these two colonels that in actuality, it was going to become much easier to control people because uh, having access to their data and being able to use things like artificial intelligence to track them and to slowly and even uh, even uh, just recently there was a report that came out that now they believe they have AI that can that can identify when people are not actually um, essentially taking in those communist principles into their very um, nature and so you know, having this ability to have the, the data that that people produce as they go around and do what they do, uh, and then using that to influence their perceptions, their 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 beliefs, and and certainly their behaviors, 
then that would enable a much uh, more systematized um, ability to control political and social outcomes. And I think what's happened over the last, say, certainly since the, um, the introduction of the iPhone, has been a definite um, increase in the ability for governments and, and, and institutions to use data to control um, those that, uh, whose data they have. It's kind of ruling by technocracy. And you mentioned in your book, you know, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a massive infrastructure project, but one of the, high, the key highlights that you made was that the key infrastructure of that is not the roads and the ports and the highways, et cetera. It's the technology and how even in African countries are going in and giving them high quality phones with high quality cameras for really inexpensive building cellular 5G networks because they what they're doing is that they're building their grid for their technocracy control through that. Now, on a recent op-ed, which you wrote for Fox News, you talked about the manipulation of society via technology, like social media, et cetera. But you specifically referenced the fragile fabric, the social fabric here in the United States. So can you elaborate this a little bit more and explain how this works? Well, I don't think um, it's just the Chinese that have you know, enabled this capability um, in terms of the, the unraveling of the social fabric of America. Uh, There's a good book out there um, uh, called Cynical Theories that really talks about the rise of uh, postmodernism and and in particular activist postmodernism, which really um, uses the power of words to break down the, um, the, the foundations that were laid during the Enlightenment period. In other words, you know, uh, facts and science are um, less about facts and science, and they're more about promoting a, um, a, an exploitive system, uh, social system. And in order to, um, to create a new system that doesn't exploit the underprivileged, that we have to use the power of words, and in particular, the power of, um, you know, super-empowered groups to go... <laughs> To talk about, you know, what is actual reality, not, you know, what is facts in reality, but what is these perceptions of people who have, you know, essentially that are that are allowed to um, be the purveyors of, 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 of knowledge in our society. And we've seen that um, be a way for um, almost a, a nascent uh, tribalism in America to arise. And so what what China seeks to do through um, unrestricted warfare is continue and amplify those that social discohesion that's created by things like critical race theory. And so they amplify it and they use social media and they use their uh, influence on um, corporations. And one of the ways they, they, if you think about it from a from a working class perspective, because the ones that are harmed in many cases are the working class, the taking of factories, you know, which limits limits, um, employment opportunities, uh, limits economic opportunity. And then um, when you start to pull at the social fabric, when you have less economic opportunity, then these things become uh, more acute and and they certainly become more pronounced in, in terms of you know, how they manifest themselves in, you know, our, you know, hyper-partisanship. So I think it's, um, it's not totally the, the fault of China that we are like this, but certainly what the Chinese uh, two PLA colonels recognized was that he, they could exploit these existing vulnerabilities, amplify them, and then continue to, um, you know, not only take away jobs, which, you know, if you think about it, For the most part, and and I found this true no matter matter where I want, even in China, people don't care about politics. They don't care about, um, you know, these issues um, unless they don't have work. If they don't have jobs, they can't feed their family. These things become much more amplified because, you know, there is a there's a general dissatisfaction with the way the country is going. So if you go to China and you say, you know, how popular, for example, is the Chinese Communist Party? It's extremely popular. Why? Because everybody has jobs. They can send their kids to school. They, you know, they can buy a home. They can buy a car. They, 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 in many ways, they are living the American dream. And they're living the American dream because precisely because, you know, what China has done in terms of eroding 
um, economic opportunity in the United States through their um, through uh, this paralytic parasitic relationship. And so, when you have in America um, this general malaise or this general feeling that the country is not going in the in the correct direct, uh, direction because there's no economic opportunity, million literally millions of jobs have been lost. Then these social problems begin to really. Um, they they catch they they begin to um, f- have fertile ground for for to spread you know division and that's exactly what the Chinese do and then in addition to that something that's very you know underreported um, I I think people understand that there's a general uh, drug issue they don't understand that fentanyl which is a highly highly potent non- narcotic which is killing tens of thousands of Americans every single year drop so you lose jobs and into these communities uh, comes these very powerful um, drugs that are killing people all of that comes as well from china so you when you when you think about it what they're doing is really just um they're amplifying problems that exist in our own society but they're also you know, injecting things like fentanyl into the system that really creates and, and, and exacerbates. So when you go into communities that used to be, you know, say manufacturing towns and you, um, you, you see the communities, they're dying. The communities are dying. A good example of this is Detroit. You look at, if you look at pictures of Detroit, you know, after the 2000s, and you look at pictures of Germany after the 8th Air Force bombed them, I mean, you have these hollowed out neighborhoods in Detroit. You had the same thing in Germany. So, again, it's, it's using war in a, in, in a completely different way, in a way that we don't recognize as, as you know, uh, certainly as acute as, say, 9-11, you know, where, you know, over 3,000 Americans lost, lost their lives. No one would dispute that losing 100,000 Americans, over 100,000 Americans to fentanyl overdoses like we did last year. Nobody would argue if, you know, that 100,000 were to come in an instant because the Chinese bombed one of our cities. But to allow it to happen over time um, and, you know, in the numbers and, and, and basically um, in a way that's stealthy, then we don't see the attack. We 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 basically see it as something that's endemic to our society and not coming from outside. But when you actually trace a source, um, you trace it to China. And you know, if you look around in our country, you know, I was born in the early '80s, so it's you know, I haven't seen. I don't know what it was like to live in the '50s or '60s or '70s, but I've I've heard stories and I have an understanding of that. But to me, it seems like our country is in the weakest and most just kind of near destroyed state that I've ever seen. Um, you know, you've got, you know, race wars, we've got Antifa, BLM, you've got cities burning down, but you've got a fentanyl crisis, right? You've got even the gas prices now, the the supply chain issues, you had the lockdowns that, you know, a lot of ways were modeled after, you know, what, you know, Xi Jinping was using in Wuhan, which a lot of experts you know, believe was intentional to get that same lockdown model carried out across the Western world, especially to cripple our economies, get rid of small businesses, and also just to train the, the people in those countries to be subservient to a, a you know, bigger government. How, how many of these problems do you think point back to the CCP? Because especially within America, you have this left-right divide and you have each side always blaming the other side. Well, okay, it's the Republicans' fault. No, it's, it's the Democrats' fault. Okay, we've got eight years of this. Now we've got eight years to switch it and fix everything. But it never really fixes it. And I think we're all busy pointing the fingers at, I think, in a lot of ways, the wrong people. And when you, when you read and understand unrestricted warfare, you can see, wow, so many of these problems are probably coming from the CCP. So starting with what you mentioned with the, the gutting of our manufacturing jobs and everything up to what we see now, how much of what, is, what our country is today is a direct result of the CCP's actions to slowly cripple and destroy America? Well, I definitely have seen it accelerate during the COVID you know, pandemic or you know, the, the, the pandemic that was you know, invented uh, I would say by the Chinese Communist Party for exactly the purpose that you state, which is to, um, uh, you know, to get us to to shut down our economy and to rely even more so on the supply chain which they own. I think um, 
you know, America, for the most part, has been through uh, cycles of economic decline, uh, at least in economic opportunity. We've been through a Great Depression. We um, we went through, uh, and, and prior to the Great Depression, if you remember, there was this um, thing called the Gilded Age, and uh, and you had the the um, uh, they called them the the um, the robber barons, and I think. You've had these cycles in the United States where you know antitrust comes, uh, antitrust legislation. So the government begins to fix itself, and and, and it fixes itself because people you know uh, enter politics who want to fix a problem. And we have a we have a representative republic that that tends to want to right the ship. And I think the the problem that we face today is that you have. You've never had a great power um, like China that was so thoroughly ensconced in our institutions, whether they be uh, corporate or financial or political or academic, and our in- international institutions like the UN and WHO. You've never had a great power with the with the throw weight of the Chinese Communist Party. And I think you know if it weren't for China. I think we could begin to fix our problems because the you know our representative government you know that nature of that government would would begin to reassert itself in, in representative democracy and I think what you have today is you know and it's not just the Chinese the Russians do it although just to a far smaller scale as do the Iranians and the North Koreans and as do any uh, of the other uh, authoritarian regimes they all begin to lob stones into this into this morass and i think you know we're just we've never had a great power like china have the ability to undermine our society from within to the extent that we do now so i think we could probably get through this if it weren't for you know the incredible resources that china has the money the people the you know now the you know the the almost the largest economy in the world if you and it certainly is if you uh consider purchasing power parity parity this is um this is what's you know so i i would i don't blame 100 percent of it on china we've gone through periods of um upheaval here in the united states but we've typically been able to uh, fix it ourselves but when you have an outside source that seeks to you know amplify those um differences and certainly to suppress what would be the good things that come out of democracy to 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 help fix it then you have, I think, a recipe for you know disaster. The only the only good thing that I see, you know, really um, in the recent times coming out of China is there there, you know, the, the, certainly Russia's attack of Ukraine has shown, uh, you know, what their um, what their true colors are, and I think China is starting to be much more aggressive, and so we're starting people are starting to kind of wake up to it, but it's still too little, too late, far too little, too late. In, you know, mentioning with what's happening with Russia, you know, one thing that really stood out to me in Unrestricted Warfare was the, the the amount of time they dedicated to financial warfare, specifically talking about the if you can collapse a currency, if you can send a country spiraling into depression, you know, that's one of the most effective ways to wage war against a country. And so right now, if you look at what we have happening, right, so the the U.S. dollar, which Nixon pulled off the gold standard, what really kept the dominance of a dollar in the world was going back to the Bretton Woods Agreement and the agreement that the Saudi Arabians would uh, trade oil in the U.S. dollar, right? You know, establishing us as a world reserve currency, the petrodollar. That's what's really established our dollar and the demand for our dollar globally. Whereas what you have right now, and this is, you, you heard rumblings of it, but it's, it's much more in the forefront of the, even the news and discussion is that the you know China, Russia, the BRICS nations, which are now in talks with Saudi Arabia to join the BRICS nations, they're actively working to basically to to kick the U.S. out of that position, to you know to remove the U.S. dollar from that you know sole petrodollar and have the petro yuan, and they have also the the you know the digital currency they're bringing forth, um, backing a lot with what they're doing with gold. Those moves, even if Saudi Arabia comes out tomorrow and says, you know what, you know, we're no longer going to hold this exclusive agreement with the United States to only trade oil in the U.S. dollar, just those moves alone, I think, will have a crippling effect on the strength of our dollar. And we'll probably see hyperinflation and who knows what that could lead to. So do you think that in addition just to being, you know, the, the geopolitics, 
But do you believe that that is part of their war against us, is to be doing, taking these steps to purposely target the dollar to weaken our financial system? Yeah, and I think the, 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 there is a flaw, though, in their plan, and that is their financial system is not built on um, reciprocity, right? They don't have an open currency that's tradable. It can only be exchanged by the People's Bank of China. So they have a non-convertible currency. They have strict capital controls in China. And so when you look at their system, it's not a system where, you know, it could, you know, where they could essentially overtake the global financial system with the yuan. And the reason is, is because their financial system is a system of suzerainty. In other words, every country that is not China becomes a tributary state of China because only the People's Bank of China can exchange the yuan. Uh, it's not a market traded currency. And so, I don't think, in, in terms of the way that we look at the world today, you're going to see the yuan challenge the dollar. But what I, what I do believe is that China is being very successful using um, the nations of the Belt and Road Initiative, which are quite numerous. You know, many of the nations of Africa, many of the nations of Central Asia, even working with Latin America. And so what they're trying to do is to create this alternative world order, order this bipolar world, uh, in essence. So what happened during the first Cold War is we had a bipolar world, and the United States owned the supply chain, and it had the predominance of wealth. What, try, what China is trying to do is basically do the exact same thing that the U.S. did to the Soviet Union, except doing it in reverse. And so they seek to remake the world in their image by creating this this financial system that really sees other nations bowing to the dictate of china for the most part um, it is a nation where authoritarians do business with authoritarians and so in many ways if, if the chinese are the richest they own the supply chain uh, they use the belt and road initiative as kind of a neo-colonialism to to basically use debt um, debt to uh, gain control of assets and territory, uh, whether it be the port in Sri Lanka or a mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo, then they own the vast you know so, some, by estimates um, you know you know, something like ninety percent or more of the rare earth metals. Um, they um, they are grabbing up resources at a great rate. They don't have to worry about the United States, and it's um, it's you know very few uh, Western countries that end up being in this alliance because they'll own the supply chain, they'll own most of the raw materials, and they'll own it in a way that you know they have other nations whose leaders don't have a democracy there either. Um, look to China, and in much the same way that tributary states look to them during um, you know the time of the of the you know, uh, imperial China. So I think that's the difference. We're not, I don't think you're going to see China where the yuan replaces a dollar. What you're going to see is two, uh, a, a bipolar world where the far more wealthy and resource, um, field world is going to be on the side of authoritarianism. And then you're going to see an ever shrinking smaller, um, you know, side of the world, that is uh, focused on democracy and free trade. And, and I think what China seeks to do is one by one pick off those democracies uh, and slowly erode. So, it's, so think of it like a giant game of risk. And you know, China has basically uh, accumulated all the pieces, the majority of pieces on the board, where it's far easier for them to pick off these weaker, you know, weaker members of the democratic alliance to uh, over time get them to um, to to come over to their side. That's that's essentially what's going on. And the currency is a, an incredible uh, um, part of that. We haven't done you know any favors by massively um, growing um, you know our currency and by most importantly not having um, the wherewithal or the, the the strategic thinking to realize we needed to rebuild our own industrial base and supply chain. Yeah, which, and that was a big part of, of Trump in his plan of making America first. And that was also one thing that I noticed is that 
you know, the, the Trump administration, they, they clearly saw China as the threat that it was. I remember, you know, Mike Pompeo spoke a lot about that. And even on the White House website, you know, we were going on there and there was just pages and pages and pages about the threat of China, whether it was talking about the Uyghur Muslims, what, you know, climate change. And it really did a great job of exposing the atrocities, even sections on human rights violations, organ harvesting of Falun Gong, et cetera, that was all in the White House. And within a couple of days of Biden taking office, that entire section got deleted from the White House. You know, and you yeah, also and I think Go ahead. Yeah, I think the, um, the the misperception there is that you know everything was great during the Trump administration. When you look, when you actually drill down into it, Pompeo was fantastic. And so what you had was uh, the State Department, the Department of Defense, and the National Security Council clearly calling out um, what would China was doing. But then you had the National Economic Council, you had um, the Council of Economic Advisors, you had. Uh, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Treasury, doing the same things that every other administration, you know, since uh, George H. W. Bush had been doing, and so there's this fight going on in um, in uh, in the in the White House, in the interagency, on you know who gets to direct, and what the what the economic folks would say. Well, we talk, we are the ones that are supposed to talk about you know, the economy, you guys talk about war and, and, and diplomacy, Get stay out of the economy. Um, but it is about the economy and it's, it's very oriented towards national security. What you have in the Biden administration is you have a weak secretary of state, you have a weak state department, you have a weak department of defense, you have a weak defense department, you have a national security council that sees very clearly the problems that we have, but then you still have the National Economic Council, the, 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 the Commerce Department, the Treasury Department saying the same thing. So what you're seeing manifest itself is that, you know, where, you know, you had a very strong Pompeo um, that was really leading the fight from a kind of a foreign policy, national security policy perspective. Uh, you don't have that anymore. And so now Commerce and Treasury and National Economic Council are beginning to actually win the fight because who are they, who are they, by, by the way, who are they um, working for? They're working for corporate America. They're working for Wall Street. That's who these agencies work for. And so absent a Mike, Mike Pompeo or, or somebody that, or, or uh, certainly a National Security Council that has a president that really um, you know, thinks differently about, you know, how you use economics and certainly a national security sense, uh, you have the just exactly what you're saying. But it wasn't all roses under the Trump administration, because for the most part, we had the same bad actors in the Commerce Department and in the Treasury Department that were doing the same things. So, you know, looking at, you made a point earlier, you know, the game of risk and how you have this, you know, these basically these two systems emerging and all the indicators are showing that while, you know, say the past you know, 30, 40, 50 years, we benefited from the, you know, the globalization that was at, you know, at the kind of driven by the West, driven by the United States. And, you know, a lot of it was our military industrial complex being used to fight wars and secure oil resources and, you know, really expanded the imperialism of the United States. But that's contracting now. And we're seeing that China in combination with Russia and the other BRICS nations are emerging. And I think that a key moment in that was when the sanctions came about with Biden sanctioning and even kicking Russia out of the SWIFT system, which really showed that, look, we're willing to now weaponize our global financial system if you don't want to play within the rules of the United States or within the rules of NATO. And which is that's just kind of pushing that. So a lot of people say, look, that pushed... Putin further into the arms of China. So how do you see, what, what is the relationship between Putin and Xi? Are they working together? Are they, um, you know, have, have they kind of banded together? Maybe, maybe there's hope at one point that Putin was maybe kind of closer to Trump, but all the, you know, the media Russiagate stuff pushed that relationship further apart. And now we've just got Putin and Xi kind of ganging up on America? Or how do you understand this dynamic? Yeah, I mean, well, so first of all, don't forget the 24-7 media that really um, produces journalists that have no time to do their own fact-checking. And so, you know, I just read an article today that talked about the fact that there's no, you know, sources in the administration say there's no evidence yet that the Chinese are helping Russians. Um, if you go look at uh, my tweet on that, you know, uh, Kyle Bass, who's somebody I know very well, 
you know, tweet, you know, basically commented on it and showed a graph where, you know, the largest oil purchaser uh, for, of Russian oil is China. So don't tell me that the Chinese aren't helping the Russians. They're absolutely helping the Russians by buying all their oil. By the way, they're getting great deal. So when Americans are paying seven or eight dollars at the pump because of what's going on with regard to sanctions on Russia, the Chinese are getting the benefit of cheap gas. I mean, this is this is how um, you know. One of the things that I recognize as a as a general officer when I when I began to understand what was going on was that I had not been well schooled in the economics of national security. How does economic policy, trade policy, how does financial policy affect the um, you know our sovereignty and political independence? And by not understanding this. You know, I wasn't able to recognize how our, you know, our national strength was, be, was being eroded. You know, you think about if you think of national security purely in military terms, you would say, oh, America is well positioned in national security. But if you don't, if you recognize it, that actually it, it, it has politics and economics and trade and finance and all of these other things that go into that, you know, the, the industrial base, how much you produce. If you don't understand that that's a significant part of it, and in, in the case of the Chinese, the main part of it, then you don't then you don't know how to reconcile these two things. Should we have an industrial policy? You know, what should you know? How should we look at China? And I think that's the that's the main problem when you look at you know the um, the the people that are um, essentially appointed to develop the strategies that will allow. America to thrive in an order where you have a China, they don't have the intellectual tools to be able to understand, hey, you know, if China owns the rare earth metals in the world, that you can have, you know, the F-22 and the F-35, and you can have nuclear powered air aircraft carriers. Um, but if you don't have the means to produce the things that you need, um, pharmaceuticals, again, you know, if you can't even produce the antibiotics that you need to protect your population, you're in big trouble. And I think that's the part where, you know, um, so it is in thinking of the game of risk, we have so gone down this path that all I need to do is spend a trillion dollars on the military and we'll be fine. By the way, that's exactly what the Soviet Union did. They spent themselves into bankruptcy. Um, there, there was no war between the U.S. and China. They basically parked their ships and planes and tanks. Their officers and enlisted were starving. There was nothing on the shelves. So if you look at if, 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 and you look at what the Chinese did, they just studied that. They're like, this is how America beat the Soviet Union. Didn't have to fire a shot. They bankrupted. Them. And so this is the uh, this is. Uh, you know, the thing that I think that in Washington, D.C., if you could just shake people, if you could just shake them out of their slumber and say, look, what um, the CEO of this tech company is telling you is in line with what the Chinese want because he wants to sell into China. And so he's forced to, you know, basically carry their water for you. So don't listen to anything they say with regard to, uh, you know, U.S you know, uh, technology policy or innovation policy. And in, in fact, do the opposite until you can get people to recognize that, you know, you have institutions in the United States that are clearly working on behalf of China. And that risk board just keeps sm getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it really, you know, at this point, it doesn't matter who the president is, because these institutions almost are on autopilot. They're on autopilot to destroy the country. And with that being in mind, and, and again, you know, through reading your books, really understanding, you know, you tried to, to raise all kinds of red flags to various government organizations and the kinds of people that are now, um, you know, really selling out America and, and they just didn't want to listen. So, you know, if we're in a situation as a country where e even if, say, the American patriots, you know, the, the deplorables, right, even the, the folks that really care about America they, if they want to fight for freedom and defend the Constitution, but if our own government is not doing that, if our own government is not protecting us, if our own government is not recognizing that, you know, as they, they talk about in unrestricted warfare, that, you know, war is not just war. It, it's it's not just the, the typical way. It's 
financial, it's it's technology. And those are all areas that if you recognize that the enemy is views this as an area of war, say, you know, economic war, then you as a country, you should be defending against that. We should be defending against the economic attacks of China. But it seems like our own government, especially especially under Biden, who seems like he's making decisions that only weaken us and make us an easier target to be picked off by Russia and China. It just seems like our own government is not standing up to protect us. So like, where does it go from here? It is, what's the end game? Does this end in a in a kinetic ground war where China and Russia are coming on to America's soil or like, you know, where, where is this going to head? Cause I just, I don't have the confidence that our own government, which is still in control of our military is going to do what it takes to protect the American people from this. I don't think, um, you know, so in terms of a kinetic war between the U S and, uh, and either China or Russia or both, I don't think that's where it, um, where it goes. I do think that you know we're heading towards um, national bankruptcy, and I think um, that that is a, a, a great possibility. You know, in, in terms of where we're headed, I do think the Chinese have intentions to invade Taiwan, and they will at po- some point um, invade and in, 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 uh, retake Taiwan. I think in terms of where it's going um, and what people can do about it, as I lay out in the book, you have to get. This has to come from the grassroots level. We have to get back to kind of the 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 way that America fixes itself. Um, and I lay out some some proposals. You know, one of the things I talk about. You know, I've already talked about you know what crit- critical race theory is doing to our educational system, uh, and um, you know, active postmodernism or activist postmodernism. One of the things I'm encouraged by is, you know, a lot of, um, you know, increase in um, private school um, enrollments over public school enrollments. So I think, you know, what, you know, that's a market, uh, you know, driven um, outcome. The, the parents are saying, I've had it. I've had it with the way that the, the system is teaching our kids. It's leading to um, people that, you know, are divisive, they're hateful, and they can't think for themselves. And so I'm going to, I'm going to take my kids out of the public school and put them in a private school. And I want to see them learn, you know, (laughs) the ABCs and, and math and, 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 and the things that they should have been learning in public school, but weren't because they were getting all of this garbage, uh, you know, to fill their heads. So education system, I, I see that I'm encouraged by that. Um, I talk about um, a book. Um, I don't know if I talk about the book, but I certainly talk about uh, the ideas in the book. Uh, called the politics industry, and the politics industry was written by a woman named Catherine Gale, who's a businesswoman from Wisconsin. Sold her company uh, when she had this epiphany on what's going on uh, uh, with our political system, and she really recommended uh, a couple of things, changes to the way we do voting in the country. And one has to do with open primaries, where you know the top five people. Um, you know, you get the top five votes are the ones, it doesn't matter what party affiliation they have, are the ones that go forward. And then final five voting, where the person that actually gets selected uh, for, the, for the position uh, gets over 50% of the vote. And so it's a, it's a way to undermine what, uh, what she views that has grown up, and I agree with her, uh, is a du- duopoly. So in many ways, um, a lot of the things from a political perspective are self-inflicted by the parties not doing what the people want. So Tea Party, um, you know, the, the, the Trump revolution, whatever you want to call it, there's a lot of disaffection in the country. And it comes because when these guys and gals get elected to Congress or Senate or what have you, they don't actually do what they say they're going to. And it's because they are not really incentivized by the citizens they are incentivized by the parties that support them with funding. So you have to raise a lot of money when you're um, when you're running for office, and because the parties control where that money goes, they can control how you vote. And so you're you're disconnecting. Hey, this is the outcome I want as a citizen. From this is what the person is going to do uh, that I sent to Washington D.C. So in all these cases, it really comes back to grassroots. You know, at the local level, uh, I need to understand the issues. I need to you know, raise my children in the way that will allow them to be educated, thoughtful citizens that can contribute to a representative republic. And then um, in our political system, I need a way to ensure that candidates that go forward to Washington, D.C. 
work on my behalf. How do I do that? Well, so there's campaigns all over the country for um, for open primaries and final five voting to to break the the power of you know parties to control how people um, how people vote when they get to Congress or when they get to the Senate. So there's different ways to work on it. This is this is mostly about healing ourselves, and I think in healing ourselves we begin to heal our ills because. As we get people into Washington, D.C. that are working on behalf of the citizens, they're going to say, hey, you don't have economic opportunities in Detroit, Michigan. We're, you know what we're going to do? We're going to force corporations to bring back the industrial base. We're not going to just say, hey, it's up to you. No, we're going to say, if you want to sell, for example, to the federal government, you better have made that in America. There are ways, there are authorities, Title III, uh, the Defense Production Act, that the government has to restore a balance in economic opportunity in the country that are tied to national security and political sovereignty and our independence. These are things that we've done before that are um, things that that have to come through political f- reform, but this all happens at the grassroots level. So it's, it's really- from my, from, from my standpoint, just one final point, I also think we need to innovate. And I don't mean out innovate. In other words, we need to innovate faster. In China, we innovate fast enough. China just steals it, you know, by getting them out of our system and innovating. And, and in particular, I'm focused on innovating in infrastructure. You know, I think um, in digital infrastructure in particular. But I think America already has the tools it can to to to, to heal itself and to protect itself from China's predations. It's just we are we have to recognize as citizens that we're going to have to take a stand. Yeah, and that's what it really comes down to is just that we, the people, have to take responsibility for our country again. I think that we got very distracted by the bread and circuses, right? Like in ancient Rome, when they, you know, they could control the population by giving them gladiators, beating each other up and killing each other and free bread while they could just drive the country into the ground. And so I think that, and there is a, a there is a revival of that happening. And it's interesting that we just passed Independence Day, which is really this reminder that we've been here before. We've been here before as a country where um, you know, the, the, the people have been oppressed, there's been tyranny, and it was only a small percentage then. Uh, it was only a very small percentage at that time that stood up against the, you know, the world's largest empire at that time period and won. And so I think that that's what we have to do. In a lot of ways, we are, it's like kind of like how you framed your answer, really the, it's the American people that are now having to stand up against what is becoming the world's largest empire again. Uh, but we have to take control of that. So we, we've just kind of come to the first hour of this, and we've got a half an hour of a Q&A. So we're going to be going over to Rise TV only for that. But before we do that, I wanted to ask you, where can people follow you? Where can they purchase your book? Where can they learn more? Do you have a newsletter? Or Because I think that the information that you're presenting is really, really important. And if more Americans understood what you're talking about, I think that we'd probably be a little bit less focused on pointing the fingers at each other and helping unite ourselves as one nation to stand against this, you know, really this, this communist specter that's trying to swallow up the world. Sure. I'm uh, on Twitter. I'm at Robert underscore Spalding. There's no you in that, in that spelling of Spalding. Uh, I'm on Instagram, on Facebook, on you know, most of the fo- social media platforms. Uh, the book can be bought at really any place that books are sold at the published by, um, random house. And, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, really, uh, well done. I think an audi- audible form, you know, if you like to listen to book, it's, that's probably the, the way that I would get it, but you know, it's, it's out there in you know, both ebook and, um, and hardcover format. Yeah. I, I've been listening to them as, as the audio books and I find it because I, I, I drive a lot. It's just the perfect companion. Um, so, and also, so for, for folks as well, you know, sharing this video, if you have friends or family that you can share this video with, and it doesn't matter what side of the political aisle they're on, because this isn't really about, you know, Trump versus Biden, left versus right. That only thing feeds into the class warfare that the communists love to fuel uh, with, you know, the different, you know, designations and classes fighting against each other. But if you want to share this information and get it out there, this is an important thing that we have to understand. So, um, so we're now going to be hopping over onto Rise TV only for the Q and A portion. If you want to come join us, I know a lot of you are already there um, already. Uh, if in the description below is a link for a free trial to Rise TV, you can you know sign up and you can join us. And you can ask your questions. So, um, 
General Spalding, we're going to go ahead and uh, cut the feeds to the public platform. So Dom, you can go ahead and do that. And so if you're on Rise TV already, if you have any questions at all, just drop in question, right? Question in your comment and we will get to it. So, um, all right. So we first have a question from, this is from Green Eye. Uh, 